Good morning and welcome to El Soy Advisor webinar, The Soy Factory, Managing the System for Maximum Output, brought to you by Illinois Soybean Checkoff. I'm Todd Steinacher, Content Coordinator with El Soy Advisor, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I would like to thank everybody for taking time out of their busy schedule to join us this morning for this webinar. If you included your CCA number when you registered for the webinar, and you stay with us for the entire presentation, your number will be automatically submitted for one CEU in crop management. If you are listening to a recording of this webinar, you will need to go to Certified Crop Advisor website and self-report your credits. You can ask questions during the webinar by using the tool panel at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to have time at the end of the presentation for a Q&A. Without further delay, I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Dustin Bowling. Dustin and his family live on a small row crop and cattle farm in North Central Missouri. He currently serves as Agrigold's Western Agronomy Manager, and in his role, he works with the agronomists, key account specialists, and customers, as well as leading the product selection efforts for the Agrigold west of the Mississippi River. He developed a love for agronomy while working for the local Pioneer Hybrid Research Center every summer throughout high school and received his degree in agronomy from University of Central Missouri. He developed a passion for solving grower problems and uncovering yield ceilings during his eight year season with ag retail and sales and crop scouting before joining the Agrigold Agronomy team in 2011. And with that, Dustin, take it away. All right, thank you very much for the wonderful introduction there, Todd, and thank you so much to Illinois Soy for uh, giving me the opportunity to share several ideas and thoughts that I've had rattling around in my head around the soybean plant that, you know, throughout the years of doing agronomy testing and helping growers just solve agronomy issues with soybean plant. And so uh, Todd did a great job of, of an introduction uh, there for, uh, me and my family, but I never miss an opportunity to uh, really thank the people that matter the most. And I love my family, my girls. We are total Missouri outdoor people. Uh, like Todd said, we live on a, a cow calf operation and row crop farm right here in North Central Missouri that's uh, depicted by that blue star in the map that you see there. Um, right, uh, I say Chillicothe, Missouri is the closest large town that we live next to. And the majority of my ag career, especially early on, it was spent in between that 36 highway corridor and the Missouri River as it cuts across the state of Missouri before I joined the Agrigold Agronomy team in 2011, working in Missouri and Kansas and Southern Iowa. And now I have the great privilege to work in that area that's highlighted in green, really going all the way up to Canada. And it's been a joy the entire time because I've been able to meet so many different growers and have seen so many different strategies of how they like to grow high yielding uh, corn and soybean. And so specifically, it's helped me to understand and uncover some insights around the soybean plant itself. And really, you know, Agrigold's journey, our journey as a brand over this past five years has been a, a lot of fun. And our soybean journey itself is very young because in 2016, you know, that was the, the first year that Agrigold decided that we were going to provide soybean seed to our customers. And for the 80 previous years, we had been known for providing quality corn hybrids. But when we made that decision to go into soybeans, um, it automatically threw our entire agronomy team back into the soybean game. And we've just been loving it. And, uh, you know, between working with NCGA high yield growers like Randy Dowdy, inspiring our thoughts on corn, um, you know, it's given us the opportunity to go out and spend a little bit of our uh, spring and summer doing different agronomy trials. And the picture you're seeing there to the left is actually, uh, that, that's uh, our family farms Polaris Ranger outfitted with a, a spray rig that I custom built in order to do some, uh, I call it poor man, you know, wide drop, doing some side dressing on both sides of a, a 30 inch row, as well as being able to spray different mixtures there with the tanks that you see. I think uh, you know the other really big source of insight that I've been able to gain on the soybean plant itself is coming from working with different yield masters. And uh, yield masters are the folks that that's kind of a agri-gold lingo for 
our partners out there, our growers out in the field that really work hard to uncover plant mysteries and uncover yield ceilings. A couple of great examples when it comes to soybean yield masters uh, in the picture there to the right is uh, Greg and Cameron McClure. Uh, they're agrigold growers. They farm right around the St. Francisville uh, home office of agrigold in Southern Illinois. And they've done a phenomenal job of, of breaking their own yield barriers on their own farm. And they've done some, put up some fantastic soybean yields over the past few seasons. And we've had uh, Greg do several speaking events uh, across the country um, along with our brand. And, you know, I, every time I listen to him speak, I kind of, I get another insight, another little nugget that I can apply to either an experience in my, my career or something that I want to try the next year um, in agronomy testing. Uh, one of our most recent uh, kind of yield masters to kind of start working with agri-gold is Jimmy Fredericks uh, from Southeast Nebraska. Jimmy planted agri-gold 3520 for the first time in 2020, and lo and behold, broke the world record dry land yield with it of 148.81 bushels. And there's Jimmy in that picture there. Uh, very proud to kind of get that relationship started with him and looking forward to visiting his fields here in the future and, and gaining more insights. And so without further ado, let's talk a little bit about the soybean factory. And really it's all about simplifying our strategies around the soybean plant. And, you know, I've seen so many growers and I've been guilty of this myself. We, we try to lump the soybean into the same category as the corn plant. And what's let us push the needle on yield in corn we, we try that on soybean and we end up scratching our head because we're had this, we have a hard time of making the soybean, soybean react to the management that we wanted to react to. And so we chalk the soybean plant up as either a very stubborn or very, you know, maybe it's too complex and it's just going to do what it's going to do. And I think by breaking it down into a factory concept will help us. I think we're going to, we're also going to talk about the raw materials that have to go through the soybean factory to, to, put out a, a high yield level at the end. And then at Agrigold, we are we always talk about the growing season in four quarters, just like uh, strategizing around trying to win a, a, a football game or a basketball game. There's key things we can influence in those four quarters of the, the cropping season that can help us put our plants into a position to win. And if you ever hear Agrigold agronomy talk, we often talk about just, you know, making sure we're putting our crop into a position to take advantage when mother nature provides that extra rain or extra sunlight. And so without further ado, let's talk a little bit about what makes up the actual soybean factory. And this concept has been rattling around in my head for a few years. And I've just, you know, if you think about it at its base level, you know, in throughout human history, we are tied very deeply to agriculture. It's provided us life throughout the history of mankind. And so we naturally call a lot of things like factories, we call factories plants. I have a, a very good friend who's in industrial maintenance and you know, it hit me one night talking to him. He said, well, I had to go to the plant, something broke down in the plant or man, the plant is just really running smooth right now. You know, We call factories plants by nature because there's something that we physically plant into an area, into a geographic area and we harvest or use all the natural resources we can to produce an end product. It's really no different than planting a soybean seed into the ground and utilizing the natural resources that are there to produce an end product at the end of the day or at the end of the season, I should say. And so when you think about what a successful soybean factory looks like, it kind of looks like this. You've got 17 essential nutrients that go into healthy uh, plant uh, growth and development. You combine those 17 nutrients with sunlight and you've got an effective uh, soybean factory. The key thing I do wanna point out, and we'll talk about sunlight and heat units later in the presentation is, hey, you're, the factories that you're putting out there, they are 100% powered uh, by solar. Like imagine solar panels running an entire plant. You have no battery backups or no extra power sources <laughs> out in mother nature. And so, if the sun's not out, you know, the lights aren't on in your factory, essentially. And so, and then of course, the other thing that's really key within the soybean factory itself is, is how much time we have to get this done. You know, we have one season, we have a set amount of time to produce the maximum output that we possibly can. And we have, 
if you will, quarterly marks that we necessary that we have to hit throughout the season in order to be successful at the end of the day. And so let's talk about what really drives the soy factory itself. And we're going to talk about the big three nutrients, right? Notice I'm saying big three nutrients, but there is absolutely no mention of N, P, or K on the screen, right? The, the three nutrients most that most determine your success on a per acre basis is carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, okay? They are the power sources of the factory. So when you think about carbon itself, it is literally the building block of life. Every organic compound on earth has carbon in it. You and I are carbon-based life forms. Um, it's the building block of life. And when you combine it with energy, like oxygen and hydrogen, you can do some pretty special things uh, on this planet. And when you mix all of those with sunlight, you get the formula that you see in the middle of the screen, which is photosynthesis. And so this is the most important part of any plant uh, or any soybean factory is, you know, this is how the lights stay on. And so when you think about oxygen and hydrogen, uh, to go a little deeper with them, they are, they're just pure energy. Both of those in their purest states are highly flammable. You know, we've seen oxygen bottles with the highly flammable uh, sticker on them. Hydrogen, we remember the Hindenburg, the blimp in Germany that, that blew up because it's highly flammable. To put it in other perspective is if you or I don't breathe oxygen for about three minutes, we run out of energy and we pass away, right? And if we don't drink water, H2O, for about three days, we run out of energy and we pass away. And so, you know, these three things are key for a successful season, but because they're out of our control, we often put them aside and we don't think about them. But the, the one thing I do want everyone to think about is, is that not all plants are created equal when it comes to this process. And so let's think about the soybean plant from a carbon fixation standpoint. Of course, carbon fixation is a really hot button topic out in the, uh, out in the world right now with climate change, but we're just gonna stick with an agronomic side of this for right now. There's really three modes of action or three forms of photosynthesis that help plants fix carbon. And every plant on earth kind of falls in one of these three buckets and the soybean falls into the C3 pathway of photosynthesis. And so to describe this to you, uh, you know, plants breathe CO2 in through their stomates. And those are those little um, objects on the bottom of the leaf that open and close and do respiration for the plant. And when a C3 plant like a soybean breathes in CO2, it actually fixes a three chain molecule when it does that. And then of course it breathes out uh, oxygen. The interesting thing about the C3s is they are the most numerous. They're nearly 85% of all the plants on earth are a C3 pathway plant. But again, the interesting thing is when they hit heat or they hit some type of stresses and the stomates close, the plant is not able to continue the carbon fixing problem within its cells, uh, a process, not a problem. But when the stomates close under stress, it can't continue to fix carbon. So that brings us to the C4 pathway, which is uh, a corn plant falls in this category. They breathe in CO2 the same way and do everything pretty much the same way as the C3, except because these plants have developed in tropical backgrounds or tropical parts of the world, they can close their stomates, stop that breathing out water vapor and respiration process and continue to fix carbon within the plant cells. And so this gives them a certain leg up when it comes to the speed at which they can fix carbon and the speed at which they can take in, you know, all the other natural resources and grow. The third pathway is, uh, you know, very familiar. If you've ever uh, traveled into the desert, you've seen a lot of these plants. They're cactus or cacti and succulents. And these are called the CAM pathway. They really do everything the same way as a C3, except they have evolved because they're in the desert to only do respiration processes at night. And so uh, it harvests sunlight throughout the day, but then does its uh, breathing in and breathing out process at nighttime when the temperatures are cooler. Now, the one thing I wanna point out is we often, again, we lump the soybean plant in with corn a lot in our management practices and the styles that we try to do, but at their bare bones, they're just wired differently. And I think it's something that we need to take a deeper look at. And the best way that I can actually point out that why they are wired so differently is just to show you the sheer volume or remind you rather 
the sheer volume of biomass they're able to create. And so think about it this way. The soybean plant, we put 120,000 seeds out there on an acre. And if we get 80 bushel, we're absolutely tickled, right? 80 bushel of biomass or 80 bushel of in, in use. On the flip side, you take a corn plant, you only have to put 30,000 seeds out there and you get 250 bushel per acre. And so to put this into a, a, an analogy, and I love simple things. I'm from North Missouri, remember? I, I love simple things and simple analogies. But at the end of the day, a corn plant, because of its C4 pathway and its metabolism, if you will, it, it operates at like a sprinter's level metabolism. It's gonna be very reactive to all the nutrients you give it. It's gonna react very quickly and it's gonna keep pushing towards the goal at a much faster rate, accumulating a lot more carbon and a lot more uh, natural resource fixation along the way. Whereas our soybean plants, you know, they're like the cross country runner. They've got the long game in mind and they, they chug along at a steady pace. And so that means they're just not as reactive to some of the management practices that we're used to doing on the corn side. And so at the end of the day, they're just wired differently. And that's something that we need to take into account as we think about soybean management and practices going into the future. Now, I don't wanna miss this point because I spent the first eight years of my season uh, doing a lot of herbicide prescriptions, fertility work, working in ag retail. And water hemp might as well be the Missouri state flower. It's the weed that we battle the most. And I'm sure some of you might be surprised or maybe you're not surprised, it's a C4 plant. The water hemp has a very similar metabolism to a corn plant, which means it can fix biomatter or biomass, it can fix carbon and it can compete for nutrition in the soil way faster than a soybean plant. And so I don't wanna miss this opportunity to stand up and say, the only way to truly get around or to manage this weed is to use overlapping pre and post residuals. I've already seen too many fields, whether it's uh, enlist or extend fields in Missouri in 2020, where growers waited way too late to try to manage this. And you pretty soon you see those water hemp plants just working their way up through the canopy, just like a volunteer corn. There's no way that a soybean plant will ever be able to outcompete these weeds if you don't get way ahead of them. And the best way to get ahead of them is very early with residuals. Um, this, uh, the picture with the growing points of the water hemp plant, I believe come from a BASF technical slide from years ago. And, um, you know, a growing and emerging seed that's just germinating only has one growing point of a water hemp. And if you wait until they're six inches tall, they have 30 growing points and they have a, a ferocious appetite. And so, I'll get off my soapbox from, from weed management standpoint, but definitely wanted to point that out, that you're going up against a very, very aggressive competitor, and you don't want to let your soybean plants get behind when you're dealing with water hemp. Okay, so back to the factory concept. Let's talk about the raw materials versus plant processes. So, of course, we're not going to be able to have time to go through all 17 uh, nutrients in full detail today with our limitation of an hour, but um, I do want to point out some key things. And so the, the highlighted in red, you're going to see, or I should, let me back up. The chart you're seeing is the grain removal and the amount of nutrition measured in the stover from 100 bushel per acre soybean um, plant. And this comes from Ag PhD reference there at the bottom. This is a part of their app that they use. It's a great app. The products in red, we'll talk about those as they are really the raw material. So when you think of raw material in a factory, Think of the, the biggest volume raw materials it would take a Ford or GM plant to have on hand, right, to produce a thousand cars. They would need a lot of metal and plastic, let's say. Probably more plastic these days than metal back in the, you know, the good old days. But um, think of nitrogen and phosphorus. I mean, they are that big bundle of raw materials that have to be present in order to produce a big volume at the end of the day. Because when you look at those numbers, you know, 325 pounds of nitrogen ends up in the seed of a soybean seed versus the 110 that they found in Stover. Phosphate's the same way. A huge percentage of phosphorus ends up in the actual grain at the end of the day. Now, the other uh, particular nutrient that's that I would describe as more of a raw material than versus plant processes would be copper. The interesting thing about copper is that it's really responsible for lignin production um, as well as cell wall strength. 
And so it often is attributed to elasticity of a plant. And so if you want your plants to be more uh, wind tolerant, you know, you can load those plants up with copper and it'll actually increase its flexibility. The other thing and why it's important with soybean seed is that the soybean seed is a very fragile object. We all know that soybean seed, you know, they don't overwinter. It's hard to carry seed over. If you uh, bang them around too much, you lose your germ. And it's because those vital uh, embryonic tissues of the soybean seed eventually, you know, they're held really closely to the surface. When you have plenty of copper, you create stronger cell walls and more elastic cells within the seed itself. And so there's a lot of seed producing folks out there that, you know, if you're growing um, production of soybean for seed itself, they're actually re recommending a lot of copper applications to improve the quality of the seed and the elasticity of the seed. But um, to jump back in onto the rest of these raw materials versus plant processes, you've got the two in yellow I've got highlighted. So you've got sulfur and you've got potassium. You know, these two are close to 50 50. Um, as far as a straight uptake, um, the, the soybean plant itself will actually need to uptake about 350 pounds of K. So that Stover number is a little deceptive on the app. But trust me, when we talk about potassium, it is a heavy, heavy raw material, but it's even heavier with regard to plant processes and the, the factory structure itself. In fact, we have been calling really potassium for the last year or two. It's the factory builder. Whether you're talking about corn or soybean, K is the factory builder itself because such a huge amount of K is required for plant growth. And when we think about sulfur, it's about a 50-50 split as well, raw material and plant processes. Now, the one key thing I wanna get back to on potassium, I don't wanna miss this point. Um, when you think about potassium itself, we noticed the trend for higher volumes of potassium or higher usage of potassium back when we started working with NCGA growers. We noticed the folks that were winning the NCGA contest were using a lot more K. And it makes total sense because if you were operating a factory and let's say that the management decided to send you 3X the raw materials you need so you can 3X your production, but if they don't send you extra people, extra resources, or allow you to expand the infrastructure of your factory, you're never going to hit your end goals. And so how many times have we seen growers with regard to corn put 400 pounds of nitrogen on in corn and still get 200 bushels of corn at the end of the day? You've got to take time to make sure that you're building a plant factory that's big enough to move all that nutrition to the end of the line for your final production number. Um, and so I didn't wanna, didn't wanna miss that point. So when you look at the products that are in green, you know, these are, the, these are the raw materials that really go into plant processes, okay? When you look at the, you know, the sheer amount of magnesium and calcium that end up in the stover versus in the grain itself, it's easy to see that these are the kind of the hidden figures behind the scenes that really make everything go within the factory itself. And particularly, I'm gonna call out calcium. Now, if K is the factory builder, I'm gonna call calcium the plant manager or the logistics coordinator, if you will. Uh, a big amount of calcium that's used within the plant is spent um, not only in you know, cell wall, cell membrane function, but it also serves as a messenger function within the plant. And so if a plant would, would hit some type of biotic stressor, Calcium is actually generated and used to send messages and through throughout and within the plant itself. And so I think a good way to highlight this that explains it is if we look at Mulder's chart, and of course, this it kind of explains the interaction between nutrients within the plant itself. And look what's right at the top, it's calcium. Calcium has a lot of arrows pointing to it and going away from it. And so that really shows that it is kind of that plant manager itself. And so and also we've seen, you know, soybeans that, that get planted into low pH, low calcium environments, they just really don't thrive. Where corn is probably a little bit better at handling lower pH and lower calcium environments itself. Um, and so that's a little bit of, of a good overall picture of just all the raw materials and kind of where they fit in place. And so at Agrigal, we've done a series of different studies on micronutrients and secondary nutrients. And I want to, uh, you know, take the opportunity just to you know, instead of talking at a high level, let's actually talk about how some of these nutrients can affect the soybean itself. 
and we'll start out with sulfur. And in 2018, myself and uh, as well as one of our uh, Indiana, Ohio agronomists kind of joined together to replicate just a few nutrient trials um, in both of our, our respective districts. And so we ended up with six replicated locations across the country, just specifically looking at soybeans and sulfur. You know, we have seen a lot of universities doing work around uh, ammonium sulfate and sulfur use uh, with the soybean plant. And so we decided to test two rates. And as you look to the left there, you can see that the, uh, the 100 bushel response was really non-statistical, or I'm sorry, 100 pound per acre of ammonium sulfate. But when you jumped your concentration up to 150 for the 2018 year, that's where we actually saw the biggest bang for our buck and approaching a three bushel uh, response to that application. We then tried uh, ammonium thiosulfate, which is a liquid. And, and of course I did that side dressing work with that, that uh, Polaris Ranger rig that I showed you early. And the seven gallon rate really returned the, the biggest rate of return across the country. And seven gallons of ATS is about a 90020, as you can see in the, the, um, the text off to the right. 14 gallon is just too much. There's a, there's a point of, of economical return uh, with that product. And it looks like seven gallon fits a whole lot better. Um, we also tried KTS, which is potassium thiosulfate. And the interesting thing with KTS is the, when we, you try to apply it on top of the ground, it's just not very mobile. Um, you know, potassium is somewhat of a mobile nutrient. It's just not that mobile. It takes a lot of water to get it to move. And, you know, we saw pretty well limited results. Um, the Ohio, Indiana numbers, I remember, were better than mine because they had more water, more rainfall. And so sulfur is a key nutrient. If it's something that you haven't been working with on your soybean crop, it's certainly, uh, you know, these practices are pretty easy to implement and something that you should look at. I've continued to try the ATS uh, for the last three years, and um, I'm averaging about a bushel and a half or so. 1.4 bushel is my response. Uh, no matter uh, the planting date, I've planted in April, I've planted in June, I've continued to try it in different, uh, these three these past three years and I'm getting about a bushel and a half response. And so um, it's something that could be easily implemented and, and sulfur probably needs to be taken a look at from a soybean perspective if you haven't already. Uh, the other secondary nutrient I wanna talk about is calcium. And you know we kind of dove in, the calcium is kind of that plant manager. It, it is crucial for a soybean plant. Um, and I think one of the things that we uh, picked up on quickly too is that calcium is also one of the main food sources uh, for our microbiome, for all of the, that microbial life that's in the soil. And of course, we need microbial life in order to do the nitrogen fixation piece of that. We need that relationship between the, um, the uh, inoculant that's in the soil as well as with our soybean roots so that we can start to produce nodules. And um, listening to, again, you know, those experiences uh, of traveling north and listening to different folks talk, uh, uh, Corey Oberlander, soil nutritionist up in the Dakotas, you know, was the first person I heard talk about putting a, a pint or a quart of calcium in furrow uh, with a soybean plant and that they do actually respond to that. And so we tested an in furrow one quart of just a 3% starter grade calcium in 2018. Saw almost a two bushel response from one quart. That's a pretty economical uh, return on re investment, if I remember right. Um, we also saw where if we took, went out to that fifth trifoliate and we wide dropped or side dressed a full gallon of this, that the soybean responded to that. And I think what's interesting is as we got out to R3, as we got a lot farther along in the process, we didn't get near as much bang for our buck because again, calcium is a huge component of plant logistics. You know, you need it on a lot earlier in the season. So as that plant develops that you have enough calcium to keep everything moving efficiently on the infrastructure side of things. And so um, we've, we found out that we're probably better off putting our calcium you know, in furrow or going at an early vegetative stage with extra calcium in order to, to get that bigger response. In 2018, we also looked at boron. Of course, everyone seems to be talking about and working with boron on corn. And we've, we've saw some pretty nice um, you know, responses with high yield corn in particular. But in soybeans, they're pretty responsive to boron. Um, I think the big thing where we miss the boat on boron is if you're still thinking in terms of pints and quarts, it's just not enough. You've got to have a higher concentration to move the needle. 
And as you can see here, you know, just putting a cord on, um, dribbling right beside the bean plant, virtually no response. If you go to a gallon, almost a four and a half bushel response in this study. Um, the interesting thing is it's all about concentration. Boron is, is a very mobile nutrient in the soil. And so by putting a concentration band, you know, right next to the plant at a high concentration, we were able to get a nice yield response. You know, we see similar, similar responses for those people using it in those two by two, you know, two inches over, two inches under applications with the planter as well. You go out to R3, dribbling it underneath the canopy, we just didn't get enough movement to get it into the roots. B5, foliar, that same concentration spread across a 30 inch row, it's not a high enough concentration to really, to really move into the plant. And then finally at R3, a nice response because think how much more foliage we have out there for that boron to stick to. And you're getting a, a higher use efficiency rate out of your fer fertilizer whenever you go foliar, making sure you have enough foliage out there. Um, of course, I, you know, we've kept up testing boron. I did it in 18 and 19. And the growers that I work with, if they tell me they have enough, you know, in their budgets for one gallon of 10% boron, I'm going to tell them to spray it on soybeans, not corn. 2.7 bushel response on average with, with boron applications in soybean, uh, especially here in Missouri, as well as Indiana, Ohio. And of course, we're working with some darker, heavier soils in general. But uh, all in all, I think boron on soybeans is a big deal. So one of the last uh, you know, specific micronutrients that we'll tackle is just manganese. And in 2018, we did those same uh, six locations. Uh, again, it's all about concentration. One quart, V5, virtually no response. You go up to a gallon at that same time frame, and you end up with a, a, a two bushel response. And for some reason, manganese applied foliarly at that rate showed us the biggest response as well. And so I think manganese is uh, one of those crucial uh, products for nitrogen metabolism within the plant. And so, you know, we just looked at that chart that says 325 pounds of nitrogen have to be available to end up in the seed. That is a tremendous amount of nitrogen that has to be metabolized to raise 100 bushel soybeans. And so I think manganese is one of those products that, that probably needs to be in the mix when you're thinking about um, feeding uh, a high yielding soybean crop at the end of the day. And so, um, you know, as we transition to the, the 2019 and 2020 seasons, we've kind of taken a little bit more of a broad brush approach rather than testing so many individual ingredients. And, and really it's just a time thing. We operate a pretty lean and mean agronomy uh, group across the country. And so we were kind of stretching everybody a little thin trying to test so many different products. But, you know, one of the ideas of working with high yield corn growers is that you should put a really good uh, micronutrient package together on corn at that 300 to 400 GDU window. And we've done this nationally across the country for a couple different seasons now. And uh, using the, uh, the Brandt products that you see listed at those particular rates on the slide. And what we've boiled down to is that this is a good process. And for high yielding corn, you know, those, bush, those environments over 225, we consistently see, you know, close to a six bushel response I think the, this mix would roughly cost around that $15 per acre mark. So you're seeing some positive responses. However, I would challenge again that, that by doing this on corn, we've, we've decided to test it a little bit on soybean. And I would challenge the fact that if my growers that I work with closely came to me and said, hey, I can only put this on one acre, this mixture, what, what, should, you, what should I put it on? I would almost tell them that they're better off foliar feeding their soybeans. And just because of this, I have two years of data. Granted, it's, you know, a few locations, just a couple of years in my backyard. But that particular mixture is averaging 4.7 bushel response. And we're in a 55 to 60 bushel environment. And so I think our goal as an agronomy team, I've pitched this idea to our entire team of doing this mixture at a much higher level across the country. And I'm really hoping that we see uh, some really nice results at the end of the day. And uh, we're making that application right at R1, and I'll, I'll allude to why R1 later in the presentation. Soybean tissue testing. Um, 
Agrigold for the last five years has been the seed company that's probably been leading in tissue testing. We have well over 3,000 uh, corn tissue samples tied back to yield and environment. It's given us a wonderful database to help guide growers as they kind of jump into high yield corn. And I think our goal is to do the same thing here with soybean tissue testing. And 2020 was our initial um, testing pool that we did. And we saw some pretty neat results from 45 to 105 bushel. And later in the, in the presentation here, I'll actually show you one of these charts and how we can start to use this type of data. But let's jump into the different, the four quarters of the, of the growing season and how the soybean kind of reacts to different things throughout the season. And we're going to start right off with stand establishment. And I truly believe after seeing soybeans for a number of seasons at different planting dates, that the absolute most important part about stand establishment with a soybean is when you start. And so picture the different timings and the factory size that you could potentially build, whether you're talking when, with regard to individual plants. Think about how big a soybean plant can get if it's planted April 15th at a lower population, let's say 80,000, right? You've got an extra 30 days between April 15th and May 15th for root development, shoot development, and uh, nutrient uptake. By the time you get to May 15th, you know, you're already sitting there thinking, mm, I should probably be planting 120,000, 130,000. By the time you get to June 15th, it takes a lot more factories in order to equal this very similar amount of pod production and seed production you might get out of that one plant back in April 15th. And so, you know, we often think about our, our grandfathers and that farmed you know, they were wired to go plant soybeans in a drill at 200,000 seeds. And why, and that probably was their best management practice back then, because if you think about it, they didn't really start their soybean planting season until the corn was all the way in the ground. And from May 20th to June 20th, they spent their entire summer trying to cover every acre with a 15 foot drill. And so planting 200,000 seeds back then probably was the best management practice. But today with our seed technology, our planter technology, we can truly go earlier with a bean crop, we can plant less, and we can let that soybean factory grow to its full potential. And I know, why would a seed company talk about selling less seed and shipping it earlier when we always, when we, you know, we struggle as a seed industry as well to get seed where it needs to go anyway. So I know that uh, our logistics people at the home office are probably like wanting to shoot me right now talking about this, but getting started early is really a, a big part of the key. Remember, soybean plant is wired like a cross country long distance marathon runner. It needs more time to get to its goal than a sprinter. So how big can the factory get? And I think these, these pictures do a wonderful idea of kind of just showing you what the potential of soybean could be if we planted it in a very fertile environment and we planted it at lower populations earlier. And these pictures come from Jimmy Frederick uh, he invited our local uh, agrigold team out to look at some of the stuff he was doing this summer with the 3520. And that picture to your left is the agrigold 3520 planted in 30 inch rows at 20,000 plants per acre. I mean, look at the natural ability of a soybean. If you give it space and give it time, what it can actually do. Uh, on the picture on the right, you're seeing 60 inch spacing twin rows planted at 50,000. You know, if you were going down these roads, you're going down the road at 60 mile an hour, you would just think that's just another bean field. Not a lot of space in between the, the rows. There's a good canopy closure and you've got a massive amount of seed pods on there. And so uh, pretty exciting to see the potential of what a soybean can do if you give it enough time. The other reason I think that we can plant soybeans earlier is they are so much more cold tolerant than I have ever given them credit uh, in my past, past years. Uh, way more cold tolerant. And I think a lot of it has to do with the ambitional chilling injury. You know, it, every, every season here in the next 30 days, I guarantee we're going to see an agronomist from somewhere, from a university or from a seed company, that's going to talk about ambitional chilling injury on corn. Because when those soil temperatures drop below 50, we run the risk of sucking in water that's colder than 50 degrees and that those plant cells get very rigid and it can mess up the germination process of corn. Well, they can do the same thing for soybean. Where soybean has the advantage is just look at the chart to your left. 
it's so much more water soluble than a seed corn is, right? I learned this the hard way from loading grain trains in my early years right out of college. If you leave soybeans on the top of a rail car for two weeks, three weeks with rain, it turns to peanut butter, right? It's terrible. Likewise, corn just kind of, it starts to germinate. It doesn't really get that messy, but soybeans are very water soluble. So if you have temperatures at 50 degrees or above, the soybean seed itself is going to take in water, that warm water, much, much faster than a corn plant can. And you still need a, there is a slower osmotic, you know, induction of water in there. But all in all, a soybean seed can take in warm water about twice as fast as a, as a seed corn can. And, you know, I did a, a, an actual planting date study on my own farm last year in, in, in uh, 2020. And I planted soybeans April 8th. And then I went, I waited through a terrible, terrible cold spell and then planted the rest of the farm on April 21st. And this is on some pretty tight, tough clay, right? This should probably be pasture type of a farm. And, um, you know, you can see at the end of the day, no, virtually no difference in stand and or yield. And I just want to take it, let you look at what these soybeans went through, because I was absolutely uh, blown away with the soybeans plant to handle this much cold. This is every soil temperature, two inch soil from my hometown. Uh, the one thing about COVID launching the timing it did last year is that I was trapped in the office. I think this is the first year I've ever taken a soil temperature every single day uh, through pretty much the entire month of April, but it's come in real handy to tell this story. So you can see this, uh, the red line is 50 degrees. You can see April 6th, 7th and 8th, we climbed to almost 58 uh, degrees as far as the soil temperature on these clay soils. And we went ahead and dropped a little seed treatment trial right here on the 8th. The next morning, it dropped down to 50. And by the following morning, you're already down to 40 degrees and it never climbed above 50 until we got back to April 21st. And you can see some lows in there of 35 degree soil temperatures. And, uh, you know, these beans are, were put in with a John Deere 7,000 an inch deep. This is, I'm not operating very, very fancy equipment. And you can tell they emerged fine. And when you got to May 12th, here's the uh, April 8th planting with the unifoliates out and its first trifoliate already coming, where our April 21st soybeans were, you know, a, a full stage behind at that point. And so um, if they can get through that kind of a, a weather trend, as long as you hit a six to 24 hour period, where in the cold, you know, if you're operating at 48 to 52, it's going to take closer to 24 hours. But if you can get some 55 to 60 degrees soil temps, that soybean will go ahead and buy the, the water it needs. From there, it can put, you basically puts itself into the refrigerator and then it'll start growing when the temperatures warm up. So uh, pretty impressive. Uh, during that same April 8th time frame, uh, I did a seed treatment study, and this is a picture of the of the, the beans that were planted there. The one thing I want to call out is as you push your dates earlier, seed treatments are a big deal. Um, our three seed treatments, the first one is basically three fungicides and an insecticide. That's the AgriShield Plus. Max has an inoculant. Max with Saltro is inoculant plus Saltro for SDS control, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with products like Alevo and Saltro. But what I want to point out in that picture is that we're, when we went in super early with cold soils, where we had inoculant, we actually saw a visual response in plant growth. Um, that red line depicts the difference between plus and max. And there was about a four to six inch height difference all season long where we had inoculant planted in those early soils. And, and my farm is a corn bean uh, rotation type of a of thing. And it has been in in fact, before I moved home, it was probably bean on bean for 10 years. And so there's plenty of inoculum in the soil. But when you go into cooler soils, I think those seed treatments are a big, big advantage. And I didn't want to uh, miss out on sharing this information with you today. Uh, we live in a high SDS environment. We have cool, wet clays early. So whether we use Saltro or Olivo, I think I averaged eight bushel for the last three years of that. So Really, if you're in my area, uh, I recommend it on 100% of the acres. I just think it works. Um, when you take a broader look at seed treatments across the country, not near the high response. But what I do want to point out is that the chart that you're looking at to your left, those are all of our seed treatments, soybean seed treatment trials from across the country. 
those are all of the early planning. From April 1st to May 15th, the average yield response was, or the average yield was 71 bushel. You go from May 16th to June 15th, the average yield is 63. So literally just an eight bushel advantage. Again, getting those factories out there earlier in the season is a big, big deal. And then again, on those earlier plantings, almost two bushel response to have an extra inoculant on that seed when you go into cold soils. And then uh, I was pleased to see that Saltro, even in the late planted, actually did have you know a nice two bushel, over two bushel response, even though we had very minimal SDS across the country this year. I think some more data to validate why you should start the first quarter of your season earlier. This comes directly from the, the Precision Planning Group there in Pontiac, Illinois. They just released their 2020 uh, yield research data. If you haven't gotten a hold of this, that publication, I highly recommend it. Absolute uh, amazing research that they do there. And I uh, wanted to take a minute to call it out here, um, but this is from 2020. Their most economical planning date was April 11th. And look at the tail off on yield. If you go out to May 14th, you're already down to 65.4 bushel in, in their research. And so getting that factory started early is a huge, huge deal. The other thing is that we have really for a long, long time written off the fact that starter fertilizer just doesn't work on soybeans. And I truly believe it's because we were doing starter trials in May. You look from May 14th to June 1st, there's virtually no response to starter. You go April 23rd to April 5th, all of a sudden you're up into four and almost five bushel yield gain. And this is a combination of all the starter products that they use, uh, whether it would be uh, with Conceal 2x2 or the their uh, in-furrow uh, furrow jet system. And so um, again, cold soils, you don't have a lot of nutrition going on. You've got a lot of, you have a lot less micro uh, biology going on in the soil. The warmer it gets, the more active the soil gets. And so I think there's a couple of reasons why we're seeing good responses in earlier planting soybeans as we go, as we uh, look at pushing planting dates earlier, I think we can start to do some different management practice that'll pay. I'm gonna to flip to the, the second quarter. Um, it's the most forgiving quarter of growth. I mean, think about what we do to soybeans when they're just in vegetative. We burn them with Cobra, we roll them with rollers. There's a very relatively low um, need for a lot of nutrition. And as long as you don't kill them below the cotyledons, and that's what that picture depicts, you're gonna get these auxiliary buds to break out every time. And so get your, get your herbicide programs done during the second quarter of growth before you start bloom because when you go into bloom, it really is a major, major shift in the soybean itself. The soybean factory has to be operating 24 hours a day at its highest efficiency in the second half of the growing season. So R1 flowering kind of marks the beginning of what we would call the third quarter. Nutrient demand skyrocket, reproductive processes start. And this is probably the biggest thing that I have noticed. Imagine when your soybean starts blooming, they're not very tall. So not only does a soybean plant have to do all of its reproductive processes or get those processes started, it still has to put on two thirds of its overall plant height when you start at R1, right? So think about that. It's like, it's like building the ship as you're sailing down the river. Um, it, takes a, it takes all hands on deck to get this done. And that's why we, we kind of sought out and looked at that R1 timeframe. To, that, to do that micronutrient mix because the demand curve for nutrition is amazing. So here's a, a, a great uh, chart for 101 bushel yield from Rutgers University from you know back in the 80s. But look at that red box. Look at how the transition of just not N, P, and K usage for the first 51 days is very, very minuscule compared to full bloom, early pod, and into soft seed, right? You're, less, you're 9 to 15, you know, for nitrogen, less than 10% of the total nitrogen used is used in the first 51 days. 91% of it is used in the second half of this, of this uh, soybeans growth cycle. Phosphorus is very similar, 14% the first 51 days, 86% of it at the end. K is a little bit different because, again, K is so important to plant growth itself. It's a 19 to 80. But all in all, making sure that we've got the soybean plant operating at its highest capacity during the third and fourth quarter is huge because that's really where uh, all the yield gains really come from when you look at 
making sure you're maximizing flower and pod fill um, the environment when you go into that is, is a huge deal because of just the sheer nutrient load that has to be moved throughout the factory at this time. When you look at the soybean factory in the fourth quarter, there's a little bit of a change in mindset, right? When, when the plant goes from, goes from vegetative to reproductive, it changes. And then that source to sink relationship, when it goes from, from blooming and pod uh, creation to actual filling seed, um, that there's a source to sink relationship change there. And so I think there's a, a huge opportunity for foliar feeding during the, the R1, R2, R3 pod phase. We see that every time that we increase the pod fill length of time, right, with fungicides, the longer we can keep this process going, the heavier our soybeans can get. And I want to talk a little bit about, again, that source to sink. You know, to put it in perspective, think about it in terms of this. When do we have to stop spraying by federal label herbicides like Liberty, like Enlist? Enlist, you have to stop spraying it at R2, right? So mid-bloom, you have to stop. It's not because 2,4-D will necessarily kill that plant if you spray it at R3. It's because they know that they do not want, that we want to be good stewards of technology and we do not want herbicide residues ending up in the seed. That source to sink relationship is huge in terms of being able to, you know, tweak that soybean program. Is there an opportunity to feed that plant at that time and increase our seed weights? And I don't have the magic bullet on what that looks like, but I can imagine that products like iron have a higher atomic weight than oxygen and carbon and hydrogen, right? And so if we can get those heavier ions into the seed itself, I think we're going to do a, a nice job of increasing seed weights. And so I don't have the answer, but I do think that we're onto something with that, with that functionality within the plant. At the end of the day, you have to have water to get all this moved throughout. And of course, uh, the chart to the left shows water usage peaking in a soybean plant from R1, R2. Um, and then you've also got about from, again, from the PTI group there, uh, a 25 or a plus 20 bushel response just from irrigation, right? So if you can get water at pod fill, you can move everything you need to throughout a good, healthy infrastructure to the end use. Um, this is one of those charts I wanted to share with you about on plant tissues. So the gray bar is a 2000 GDU mark of plant tissue and the orange bar is 2400. You've got from 45 bushel to 105 bushel yield response that we did in testing. The neat thing about this is you can see from the 2000 GDUs to 2400, the tissue levels drop in phosphorus. Why? Well, we know that a huge chunk of phosphorus ends up in the seed. So the plant starts to draw everything it can and it starts shoving it from plant tissue into the seed itself. The other thing I'll point out Look at the difference between 45 and 105. On the surface, you're thinking, well, what did you really learn, right? I, you had the same fertility level there as you did 105. Well, the key is water. And I know that because my 47 bushel falls in this 45 cluster and my soybeans almost died two or three times from drought. You know, they turned gray two or three times throughout the pod fill process. And so it shows me that I had the fertility to go higher. I just didn't have the water to get it moved. You know, this 85 bushel probably had the water, but maybe they didn't have enough phosphorus to move to the next level. So there's some things like that, I think, that we'll be able to uncover um, as we continue down our tissue testing road. I want to, you know, finish with just a couple of key things here. September heat is a big deal. Um, in 2019, you know, and, and I heard Greg McClure talk about his experiences in 2019. I had a very similar. We had tons of heat. We had, we planted a little later than we wanted to in 2019 because of wet weather. My neighbors who I work closely with uh, won the national yield contest with Agrigold 6572. Um, I kept doing kernel counts, everything. I couldn't get my yield estimation to go up to go over 300. But at the end of the day, when we, when we harvested this, it went 323, it had test weights of like 62 pounds and they harvested in the low 20s percent moisture. This hybrid has a tropical background. It loves heat at grain fill. To flip it to a soybean story, the same grower calls me weeks later and he says, Dustin, you're not gonna believe it. He says, I'm harvesting whole field averages above 70 bushel on these soybeans I planted in June. 
and it all comes out to having a, a lot, enough heat and enough sunlight at the end to really drive the factory to its potential. And so here is your 10 year average for solar radiation in, in the, the section in central Illinois. This is a wonderful uh, crop extensions website from Iowa State. And you can see from May through August is really your peak solar radiation that you get in this part of the world and really all of the country. But think about starting your timeline in mid-May you put your flowering and pod fill past the peak sunlight that you get, and you have to have sunlight to drive everything. So when we say get your season started earlier, imagine starting it over here. Imagine starting it in April. Look at how much more available sunlight you naturally have for flowering and for pod fill. And we all know that this is where the magic happens is in these two sections for really moving nutrition to and turning it into yields and bushels. You can also uh, entertain the idea of, well, maybe I can go to an earlier RM, you know, planting a little bit later, but moving my maturities up. And you're really seeing that tend to work from a perspective of a lot of these high yield guys like Greg McClure is having great success in Southern Illinois with a three, five. And traditionally we would think, well, you know, that's more of a, a group four zone down there. And so I think a lot of that success is, it evolves around or has a lot to do with maximizing solar radiation and making sure you've got that flowering process started as soon as you possibly can. And the only way to do that is with more time on a soybean. You can't force more carbon dioxide into the plant. Of course, I'm sure there's studies out there that shows carbon dioxide fertilization will improve yields, but we don't have any control over that. And so we just have to control the factors that we can. And at the end of the day, you know, simplify your strategy. I hope this has helped you understand the soybean at a little bit deeper level. It's an animal that we can certainly corral, right? I think we can, the more we understand the soybean, the more we can uh, push it to its limits. We need to build the best factor we can as early as we can. And we need to focus on those key timings throughout the season. And, and at the end of the day, water and sunlight in the second half is going to drive your success. And making decisions to get that done is going to ultimately put your soybean factory or your plants in general in a position to win. And so with that, I know I used a lot of our time up, but I do want to say uh, thank you uh, to Illinois Soy for giving us the opportunity to, to uh, talk about things. And I'll kind of turn it back over to Todd. Thanks, Dustin. Uh, great insight. We do have a few minutes to, to address some questions, so we'll just uh, pick a few out. Uh, in your opinion, is a two by two fertilizer ban on a planter close enough to see much value from a soybean plant? You know, I, I think it is. I think if, if you want to focus on the right nutrients with that two by two, I think it's key. And, you know, just like we talked about boron, getting a, a good shot of on early in the season so it can use it for all of its plant processes. We know that boron is critical for, um, for everything, you know, pollen and flowering. And we know a soybean has to do a lot of flowering to, to get a lot of yield. And um, I think getting that boron early on the two by two, I think you can affect your sulfur rates with two by two. Um, you just want to make sure that we're not overloading the seed in furrow, of course. But yeah, I think it's a good strategy. Okay. Uh, next one goes back to your, your fertility trials. Uh, were you um, using tissue samples to validate uh, results and what would you find or how were you able to use that to validate things? Yeah, no, I wish we had. I think we, we went into testing those different fertility trials just really quick and dirty, right? Let's go out and let's pick a few strategies. That's why we're tissue testing now. I think from, from here over the next few seasons, in combination with fertility trials, in combination with soil testing and fertility and tissue testing, I think we're going to really uncover some really neat things. But no, I wish we would have back then. And then one last one, the boron that you were using, was it a 10% liquid solution? It was. Yep. It was a 10% liquid solution. Yep. Okay. Well, with that, we're about out of time. Dustin, again, thank you for, uh, for joining us this morning. Um, this does conclude our webinar on the soy factory managing the system for maximum output. Uh, if you would take some time after the webinar to fill out the, uh, the post survey that really goes into helping us uh, evaluate um, future, uh, future needs. Um, and then you can also you know, view this uh, webinar and others at ilsoyadvisor.com. 
and this is all uh, funded through the Illinois Soybean Checkoff uh, funded. So with that, thank you very much and have a great day.